Okay. Hi, I'm Ann Bryce, and I'd like to welcome everyone to the last program of the year. As you know, Yolo Audubon runs September through May, basically, and uh, and this is it. Um, you know, it's worked out amazingly well, the Zoom program. It, it, we couldn't believe it, and we really have Ken Ely to thank for it. He set it up and got it going and got our speakers, so I'd like to give a a round of applause to Ken, virtually. <laughs> um, so we're, we're trying to Thank decide you, what to do in the fall. I think that we'll probably do some sort of a hybrid. The Zoom has been pretty popular and I've had uh, several letters from people who said they wouldn't have come to the program if it weren't for Zoom because they live out of town or they don't want to go out at night. So. We are now working on how to have in-person meetings back at the senior center, yet also record the meeting so it'll be on our YouTube channel. And then people can take advantage of, of, uh, of either way. But uh, there's su support for doing it both ways, but, but uh, Zoom has worked uh, surprisingly well. We're also hoping to um, have field trips in person again, starting in the fall. But we're gonna continue another new thing is our Out with a Birder series that uh, John Mont Smith uh, was a board member in charge and uh, Brian Janke and, and um, uh, Nancy uh, Tyler have been the videographers. And uh, if you've checked our YouTube channels, you'll see we have several great places and suggestions for going birding. and. Uh, I think that we will uh, definitely keep that up. Um, finally, I'd like to thank uh, two of our board members who are leaving us. Uh, Erna Tarara is going off the board and so is Alan Hollander. And Alan has been on our board for over 15 years, maybe 17 years. So he gets a well-deserved rest and uh, thank you to both of them. And finally, I'd like to welcome our two new board members who are joining us and I ask them to stay on. Uh, where's Diane Colborn, if she could give us a wave. Hi, hi everyone. Is, is joining us and uh, you've probably known her over the years. Her husband was Terry Colborn, a uh, much beloved member of Yolo, Yolo Audubon as is Joanne and uh, she's gonna carry the torch. So welcome to... Uh, <laughs> to Diane. Did I say Joanne? I meant Diane. It's okay. <laughs> I knew what you meant. Yeah. <laughs> and also, because I'd also yeah. like to welcome Joanne Filotti. Uh, Joanne is new to the board and, and new, newer to Audubon than some. Joanne is an amazing photographer and you're going to see mm -hmm. some of her pictures tonight. And uh, Great. she is uh, re retired in the last couple of years and wanted to get involved in something meaningful. And we're lucky that she chose us. So welcome to Joanne. Looking forward to it. I'm now gonna okay. let uh, Al and also the rest of us who are on the board are staying for another year, FYI. So it's only, only two new people this year. So I'm gonna turn it over to Ken and he's gonna explain everything. And I would ask, uh, it just asks that you uh, go on and turn off your video and put on your mute if you're not speaking. And in the upper right hand corner, you'll see a little box that says view. If you put that on speaker view, then when uh, the speakers begin uh, their program, they'll be the only ones showing up. And it's, you know, it's slightly less distracting, but not mandatory. Okay, Ken, take it away. Thanks, Anne. Welcome, folks. Thank you for uh, joining us tonight. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So we're gonna we have uh, five presenters tonight who are going to uh, share with us their uh, burning adventures over the last year. And uh, I hope you uh, enjoy this. We do. We've been trying to do this well as long as I've been on the board for over ten years. And uh, May has always been the members' memories. Um, and it has been, you know, kind of excited to see what people have done uh, uh, in the early days when I, when I joined the board and started attending the meetings. Uh, it was a time for some folks to actually uh, learn the names of the birds that they uh, took pictures of. 
So uh, it's been educational for them. And uh, I, I think just a little bit of, uh, you know, some sort of recognition for um, their efforts at Birdings. And I really appreciate folks who are willing to share uh, with the membership. Uh, in case uh, anyone has any questions, uh, please use the chat feature and uh, make your chat go to everyone so that if someone else has the same uh, question, they'll see that it's been uh, that it's been asked already. And so uh, they'll hopefully get their answer. And um, let's see, we will be uh, trying to address uh, questions after each speaker. Uh, hopefully there won't be too many questions that uh, that becomes uh, unwieldy. And also we'll, we'll, we'll allow questions at the end of, end of the program as well. Uh, so that everyone um, you know, will have a chance to ask any questions they wanna ask. Um, I think that's about it. And so uh, I am going to start sharing my screen and we'll get started. And share. And I'll, while I do this, I'll try not to talk to myself. Okay. Hopefully folks can, can see the screen share. And hopefully the recording, if you have the recording is still going on. Okay. So members memories. Uh, I hate to read what you can see. So let me just go on to the next slide and here. There's our pretenses and I said, this is in the order. Um, this order shows, I, I have to say this and I'm sorry, order of submission. So I did not exercise my right as program chair uh, to arrange the order. I just wanted to do it uh, so that folks uh, uh, would get recognition for coming in first. And our first uh, presenter will be Michael Reinhardt and uh, on the Klamath Birding Trail. And in the chat, hang on, let me change my view of the world. Okay, there's something I can't do. I'm gonna stop sharing so that I can, all right. <clears throat> there, I put in the chat a URL, uh, Associated with his uh, with his uh, presentation, and I'll go back to sharing screen. And Michael, then you would be set to go. Okay. All right. All right, folks. You can see Michael up in the uh, upper left. Well, for me, it's the upper right hand corner. Okay. Well, <clears throat> welcome to everybody. And uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, Klamath Basin and Tule Lake in particular. I think a lot of us uh, way down here in the valley have heard a lot about Thule Lake as a birding site over the years. And I've been going up there a number of years now, at least once a year. Uh, and I made it for two of the COVID trips, uh, one in June of last year and one a few weeks ago. And a, a trip to Cooley, Thule Lake is a lot more than an excursion just to that town or refuge. You can make it as extensive as you'd like, actually. You could go all the way up to Crater Lake National Park and all the way down to Lava Beds National Monument and many, many places in between. Uh, Tule Lake's about a five hour drive for us from Davis, uh, not counting potential stops. And uh, it's right at the Oregon border. Now this uh, preceding map is from a great resource, the Klamath Basin Birding Trail. And as Ken said, he put the website in the chat. Uh, there are printed brochures. There are over 40 birding sites described and listed in, in that brochure and uh, directions how to get to each one of them, uh, which most of the time I could follow. Next, please. <clears throat> Well, there are a number of different refuges and sites in the Klamath Basin National Wildlife Refuge Complex, uh, but the real heart of it is Klamath, Lower Klamath Refuge on the west and Thule Lake on the east. There's a ridge of mountains that goes down between the two. 
Uh, there's a visitor center on the Thule Lake site, although unfortunately it's still closed because of COVID right now. Next. Uh, next, uh, great. One of my favorite sites is actually the cliff right behind the visitor center. There's a short steep trail that goes up uh, to a really marvelous observation site from which you can see the whole of Thule Lake. There are hundreds of nesting cliff swallows uh, on the cliff, uh, quail, marmots down at the base. But the highlight for me is a ledge on the cliff, way up on the cliff, uh, that's been uh, the site for great horned owls to nest for many years now. And these are the current residents. Uh, when it's open, the visitor center also has a feeding station and viewing window that draw many avian visitors. So the visitor center is a place to go right on Hill Road. Next. And right across the road is a demonstration wetland, which in season has migratory birds in the surrounding trees. It has waterfowl on the deeper areas, although right now it has much less water than usual and an assortment of shorebirds and other marsh residents. The Sora was wandering around in there this month and the Virginia rail was seen on a prior visit there. Next. And if you go further south on that road past the visitor center, uh, Hill Road, uh, you get to the Wainema Lodge, a uh, combination Lodge Motel where I've stayed a number of years. And Ken told me just the other day that he stayed there years ago. The manager is much more of a hunter fisherman, but he did direct us to a site on Tule Lake about a mile from the lodge where some eagles, bald eagles are nesting. And if you go just a bit further south on the same road, uh, you come to a levee and a gravel road across that levee, which crosses the entire lake. Uh, the number of birds and number of species you see varies from month to month and year to year, but it's really something everyone has to do. Next. Uh, sometimes there are only a few birds. And next. Sometimes there are hundreds, as it was a couple of weeks ago. Next. Sometimes you see just isolated representatives of species. And at other times in the year, next, you'll see whole family gatherings of uh, eared grebes. Next, sometimes uh, you see the isolated Western grebe uh, without much social activity. Next, and at other times, uh, a lot of social activity and interaction. Next, and you get quite magnificent displays sometimes during the year. But the Klamath Basin experience isn't restricted to the wetlands of the refuges. Uh, next, uh, this last trip, we went up to visit Agency Lake, which is just north of Klamath Falls. And there we encountered a migrating wave of yellow warblers. Uh, their songs were coming from every tree during about a half a mile walk uh, with wetlands on both sides. Really quite spectacular. Next. And then even right behind the lodge, we were serenaded by a bunch of rock wrens and uh, they're really fun to watch. Next, but it's actually not a happy time in the Klamath Basin. This is one of the water channels in the lower Klamath National Wildlife Refuge, which should be full of water. It was reported to us that lower Klamath hasn't received water for three years. And it certainly looks that way. Thule Lake is lower than I've ever seen it. Last summer, 20 to 40,000 ducks died of avian botulism on the hot shrunken ponds. There's been, as many of you know, a decades long water war involving salmon advocates, Native American salmon fishermen, Pacific Ocean commercial salmon fishermen, waterfowl advocates, waterfowl hunters, Klamath Basin farmers, and that war shows no sign of resolution. And then you add to that our current extreme drought in both Northern California and Southern Oregon, and the situation's exacerbated. And as a last concern, uh, hopefully the last, 
Um, there was the giant Caldwell fire, which burned 70% of the Lava Beds National Monument just to the south of the Thule Lake. And much of that uh, National Monument still remains closed. Next. So I think we have to say a prayer that uh, compromise in this water war can be reached, the area saved, and perhaps even returned to some semblance of its former glory. Thanks for listening. Excuse me. Thanks, Mike. Uh, and while I'm sharing the screen, I cannot see the chat, so I, I don't know. Uh, so, if Anne, if you could check the chat to, to see if there's any questions for Mike, please. I'm. I don't see any. Okay. Oops. One new. Hold on. Great presentation, Mike, from Diane Colburn, and I'm sure we all echo that. That was wonderful. And Thank so you, Diane. <laughs> there we go. Okay, Ken. Okay, are you ready for me? We're ready. Oh, okay. All right. Um, hi, everyone. It's nice to see you. Um, I'm not, am I on the speaker? I guess I am. Anyway, so the bird, we can hear you. Well, I can't see myself. I'm seeing you, so it kind of makes me disoriented. Anyway, that's okay. This Harris Sparrow uh, has a saga at my house. It came in um, in the spring of 2019. It was uh, a much less uh, adult bird, not as well marked as this one. Anyway, Harris Sparrow came to my yard and I was able to take a picture of it along with the other sparrows that I had in my yard uh, in April of 2019. And now we're, we're okay. And then um, it went away as did all my sparrows into the summer, but it reappeared in October of 2020. And this is his picture uh, from his 2020 visit in Woodland, California. So it was pretty exciting. Um, I did see that there was a Harris's sparrow happily seen over at Poudre Creek, and I went twice to see if I could find it, and I was not able to. So um, that was uh, sad to me. But anyway, I've had a Harris oh. sparrow live in my yard for over a year, off and on. Okay, next. Before I go next, I want to apologize to everyone for my very sensitive computer mouse. Uh, with the going back and forth on the slides. It is not intentional. Next. Okay. Um, a lot of you probably know that uh, even once COVID hit, I decided that I was going to bird anyway. Uh, it was not against the rules to go birding if I was alone in my car. So I was out frequently birding and um, I went on various many trips of which these, uh, the rest of my pictures are uh, representative of. This uh, lovely little, uh, <clears throat> I think it's supposed to be a rock. Is that a canyon wren? It's not a canyon, it's a rock wren, right? Tell me somebody. Rock wren? Canyon wren? A canyon. It is a canyon. Okay, well, I looked at that last picture of the rock wren. I thought, my God, maybe I don't have a rock wren. Okay, canyon wren was found on the dam at, um, Monticello, uh, where oftentimes we've stopped on field trips when we've gone up there to uh, call, look for them along the walk along where the um, where the water spillway is, and uh, we've found them very many times. Uh, when I got up there, there was absolutely nothing, and this was in um, September, uh, September 20th of 2020, and I. Uh, that well, I'm going to just play a call and see if, if if anything respond. And what I expected to respond was a canyon wren. So I called the canyon wren, and out popped this little guy. And I was so thrilled because all around the area was devastated by fires. And as you all know from the uh, the, the mon monumental fires we had last summer, and so I was very thrilled 
that this little fire survivor was able to um, come and hear my call and come out. I'm, I'm moving right along. Okay, this was taken in uh, December uh, last, um, next. Okay, I, I, on another birding trip, I decided to get up really early in the morning and I was at the Yolo bypass by um, seven o'clock, which in the winter time in December, that's at the crack of dawn. So it was sunrise and these lovely um, tundra swans were just performing quite well with the sunrise in the background. And uh, I encourage anybody to, to get up and go out to the, the wildlife area as early as they possibly can, because it's beautiful. Next. Oh, okay, here we have, now a lot of you look at that and say, oh, snow goose, but you have to know that this is not a snow goose. And you would know that by looking at the bill. The bill is very small and it doesn't have the black grin patch that a snow, uh, snow goose would have. And the highlight of this, this is at Calusa National Wildlife Refuge. There are uh, oftentimes during the winter, uh, hundreds of Ross's goose geese there and also with the regular snow geese. And I was delighted to find this Ross's blue morph. Uh, the Ross's blue morph can be distinguished not just because it looks like a, a Ross's goose, but the uh, the black uh, of the uh, blue morph feathers actually go up the back of the, the head. And I had uh, had been able to see this with John Sterling some years ago from the field. And when I saw that, I was totally delighted. Next. Okay. Um, during the um, November, I was out at the Yolo Wildlife Refuge and I got very close to the side of the road where uh, some kind of farm equipment had made some very large gashes with their tires and so forth. And there were two or three uh, Wilson snipe that were taking advantage of this. And it was very, very close to the auto tour loop. So it made it quite a good uh, photo opportunity. I did have a video and I still do have the video, which I may have posted on Facebook. I can't remember. But anyway, um, I wanted to show it, but it was it's for this tonight, but it was too long. Uh, it's 20 some seconds and that's just too long. Anyway, so the Wilson snipe was showing off and being really cute. Next. Okay, now we have a run on some some Clark's Greaves in two different places. I want all of you to, to know, because I've talked to a lot of people and they don't seem to know, that at the Sacramento National Wildlife Refuge, starting in April and continuing through, I guess, September, maybe October, I'm not sure, probably September, because it probably coincides with hunting season, there is a secondary loop and there it, it is a right off the main auto loop, there's a sign posted that says, uh, uh, with an arrow that points to pond two. And if you drive out around this pond two, you will see this very lovely lake, which is fairly shallow. And at one end of it, um, these these are Clark's grebes are nesting. Uh, that last year was the first time I was aware of them nesting there. And I was quite delighted and took a couple of friends with me on different trips. Anyway, this shows this particular photo uh, the action that's going on here is I was watching just the nesting bird on the nest and I and and a pipe bill grebe was coming along by it uh, and getting closer and closer and I thought oh this is curious and then out of nowhere while I was uh, in the process of taking pictures this other bird which I assume is the male came charging over and letting the pied bill grebe know that this was off limits. You'd gotten way too close to the nest. Next. I went back another time about three or four weeks later and was able, that's kind of fuzzy. Okay, better. I uh, was able to see very at close range, um, these Clark's grebes with the babies right along on the back. There was another baby in there, but right now it's not showing. 
a lot of you think that you have to go as far as Thule Lakes and or Clear Lake or somewhere far away, but you don't seemingly. Uh, I was just up there uh, this week uh, and the Grebes are there and we were able to see um, a pair, two pairs doing the, the, the rushing dance. So that was uh, quite delightful. So I assume that they will be nesting there again this year. So if you get a chance to go up there and want to see Grebes, now would be the time to go. Next. Now my other Grebes story happened at Clear Lake. These are eared Grebes. And my husband and I took advantage of election night to get out of town. And we decided to go over to Clear Lake and spend the evening or the afternoon and the evening. And I was out walking at dusk and I could not believe, I was limited to one photo, so I couldn't show you a lot, but there was a whole um, flotilla of hundreds and hundreds of eared grebes. This was November the 3rd. And uh, they got fairly close to where the little dock where I was watching, and then they would rush away. And then they'd stop and they'd settle back down and they'd move around again, and then they'd rush away. It was quite quite exciting to watch them. And this was at a motel in Lake, Lake Port. Next. So next. Okay, another trip I made uh, with Pam Starr, we, she had heard via the grapevine uh, that there were some baby uh, barn owls that were being seen in the South Bay. So we took a trip down to Alviso area of, uh, uh, of the South Bay area near San Jose, and we're able to find these darling little baby uh, barn owls. And they're, they were nesting, just clinging to the side of this uh, palm tree where the palm fronds had fallen away. And it was quite, quite a wonderful afternoon. Next. Okay, I was scouting for the um, Christmas bird count. The area that I was going to be doing was the road uh, Rag Canyon, and it had been totally devastated uh, with uh, by the fire that swept through there. Absolutely and totally nothing left on the ground. And then when I got to Rag Canyon, as as I moved further down the road, the um, the vegetation became a little bit less burned and and then less burned. And we got down to the bottom of the road, there is a place called Pleasure Cove, where we have, we have always birded around for this Christmas bird count. And they had been able to save the entire cove, uh, except for the edges. And so uh, uh, I went ahead and uh, did this um, scouting trip. And we were way at the far uh, eastern, uh, northeast end of the, of the uh, campground or the uh, Pleasure Cove resort. And I heard a pileated woodpecker and I just got so excited. Of course, then I had to find them. And there were two of them on these poles um, pounding away and making a lot of noise. And so I was so excited to see them. Uh, the picture I sh chose to show you, if you look really closely, you can see that he is uh, pounding on that to get some insects. You can see his tongue is just sticking out to the wood. and. Uh, so there were two of them. They were a pair, a match pair, male and female. But the uh, bottom line I'm is Connor, that. Probably. Uh, excuse me. The bottom line is when we went back for the Christmas bird count two and a half weeks later, they were only heard on the hills side by the side. We never saw them. Next. <clears throat> okay, this bird, uh, this uh, photo was taken up in uh, Sierra Valley. My husband Doug and I decided to. Uh, take a trip and just see what we can see of Sierra Valley. And this was um, in June. We went up in June of 19 and uh, just made it a one day trip. And uh, it's always wonderful to see the coots and their little redheaded babies, which we've always seen on uh, Kevin and Mary's uh, Sierra Valley trip. So hopefully any of you who are missing that this year or last year, no, the, the babies are still there. However, there can be seen babies right here in Woodland at the Woodland uh, North Regional Pond. Next. Okay, on this trip to Sierra Valley, <clears throat> we went home via 49 
and uh, I went into the Sierra Nevada field campus, which is right off there, it's a, a UC facility, and was able to, uh, I was going to see if I could see some um, dippers on the water that we'd seen the previous year. But as I was walking towards the creek, I heard the sap sucker flying, and I was able to get this video, I hope, Ken, Oh, Ken, did we get the video? Ken, hello? I, I'm just muted, Sammy. Okay, there it is down there. Before it was, anyway, never mind. Okay, it, it worked in practice. <laughs> okay, thank you for listening. I can't even, I do, I can't even find my mouse now. Okay, well, it, it, it was a cute and short little video of this red-breasted sapsucker in the Sierras building a hole for, I guess, a well. Anyway, I do want to remind everybody that this month you can possibly see um, in the evenings if you go out to K-Pay at Cache Creek and go down the creek bed, you can see the uh, lesser nighthawks. Uh, just before sunset, or just, yeah, just before sunset, this is the, the month that you see them pairing up and soaring overhead. It's a very dramatic place to go. I was going to put one of those pictures in, but they were lousy. Anyway, thank you. Thanks, Sammy. That was a great presentation. Thank you. Well, I've, I've got the rainbow spinner on my computer right now. No, still doesn't want to work. I'm sorry, Sammy. I can't even advance it. Folks, if you haven't figured out by now, we're a totally volunteer organization. And uh, with no, I'm, personally, I have no formal training. Any questions for Sammy? Sorry about that, Sammy. No problem. OK. Thank you, Judith. All right. Zane, you're up. All right, I'm cool. Going. All right, well, first off, I'll say thanks to all you guys for having me tonight. So I'm going to take you through some of the highlights I had while burning in the year 2020. Um, we all know it was an unusual year, but for me, I found burning to be something which I could do safely amidst all the craziness. I was really grateful to be able to get out as frequently as I was. And in the process, I really got to know our local spots and was also fortunate enough to make one COVID safe uh, trip further abroad with my family. Um, if anyone is interested, my camera setup is a Canon EOS 7D Mark II, which I got about a year and a half ago and I love. It is a great camera for um, bird photography. And I have also a Canon 400 millimeter prime lens which is a, between the two, the combination, I, I love it and plan to stick with it for a long time. Um, so this first photo is of a warbling vireo, which I took last May along Cache Creek. Um, I really like this image because of its background, the way the willow blurred with greens and whites. And I really like um, how it shows the habitat of the species. Warbling vireos love like streams and willows and I thought it kind of told a story, which I really liked. Um, next. Okay, so this is a least bittern, which I found last spring, also along Cache Creek and a little wooded marsh. Um, least bitterns are incredibly secretive and are rarely seen. And so I was super, super stoked to find this one out in the open in the early light. So it kind of sat there for like maybe 10 minutes while the sun was rising. And finally, finally the sun got above the trees behind me. Um, so I had the light at my back. And as soon as the sunlight got on this bird, it dropped down into the reeds and I never saw it again. Um, so it was a really, really cool experience and it's still the only least bitter I've ever actually seen. I've heard a couple, but they do not like to come out like this. So I was really happy. Um, next. Um, so south of Davis and east of Dixon, 
there's a lot of farm and agricultural fields, obviously, um, but some of them are home to nesting grasshopper sparrows. And um, I made a trip down there last spring and was fortunate enough to find, I think, two or three of them uh, singing from wires like this one. And this particular individual just decided that he found his spot on the fence and he was just gonna sit there and sing for as long as he wanted. So I um, set up my car uh, at an angle, so I had the light at my back and used it as a pho pho photography blind. Um, and this bird just sat there singing nonstop for probably 20 to 30 minutes. And uh, this was my favorite of the many photos I took. I just love how confident he is as he throws his head back and sings. Uh, next. Okay, so last summer, my family and I were able to take a COVID safe trip to Mono County. Um, uh, we brought all of our own food. We cleaned everything in our hotel room and obsessively followed travel and masks, social dist distancing restrictions, all the stuff that we've all grown all too familiar with in the last year. Um, but one day on this trip, we visited Virginia Lakes Resort. Um, some of you may have heard of it. It's pretty well known as the spot to see gray crowned rosy finch, like the one in this photo. Um, as promised, when I arrived, there was about a half dozen rosy finches hanging out on the ground underneath the feeders at their store at the little campground. Normally, gray crowned rosy finch are found at really high elevations along like talus slopes and snow fields and are just known to be really hard to get to, a lot of hiking at high elevation. But you can drive right up to Virginia Lakes Resort and they're right there. And it was just really amazing to see these birds. And just the pink on them really struck me because pink is such a rare color on birds. I was thinking there's only a couple other examples I can think of. And the whole area was just, it was really pretty. There was two lakes, plenty of trails, Cassin's finches, Clark's nutcrackers, mountain chickadees, all these high elevation coniferous species that were just everywhere. It was really, really cool. Um, next. Um, another day on this trip, we visited um, Bodie State Historic Park, which some of you may have heard of. Um, most people visit this ghost town to see the history of the abandoned gold mining area which is still sitting as it was left in the late 1800s. However, I was thrilled at the close views of this greater sage grass, which there's a group of them that live there. The park gets about 200,000 visitors each year, so it's safe to say that these grass are used to people. This one in particular was sitting right along a walking trail, just eating, I think that must be a sage flower. Um, and it could care less about the people that were walking past. And I was just really, really stunned at like the intricacies of this of the feathers and just how confident a bird it was for a species that normally is not seen up close. Um, it also had a couple of little baby sage grouse, which were really, really cool to see. Um, next. Um, so back in Yolo County, fall shore migration typically begins early often in the beginning of July. Um, but even so, this juvenile semi-palmated sandpiper, which is a fairly rare but annual visit visitor to Yolo County, was still pretty early when I found it last fall at North Regional Pond in Woodland in early July. Um, I loved how the evening light caught its buffy wash on its breast and had a nice reflection along the water. Um, semi-palmated sandpipers are Somewhat difficult to distinguish from other similar species called peeps, which are small sandpipers, including the western sandpiper and the leaf sandpiper. But as you can see in this photo, their bills are very short and blunt, almost like a little traffic cone. Um, and this was the first one that I had seen, so I was very happy with this experience. Uh, next. All right, uh, last but not least, I found out last, I think it was in October, um, that there was a greater roadrunner hanging out at a winery in Cape. And I set up a like an access to see it. I called them and went out there. And sure enough, this roadrunner was hanging out at this winery. It's got um, 
Tavera Ranch Vineyard and Event Center, which if any of you are interested or are in the Cape Valley, you definitely should visit. It has great food, olive oil, and I myself wouldn't know, but I've heard from others that it has fantastic wine. Uh, it's definitely worth a stop. But for the bird itself, uh, this bird was just hanging out in the winery and was pretty confident. I think it even has a rat in the bottom right corner. Yeah, um, which it had caught and it was carrying around. Um, so it's just an amazing bird and very confident. Um, so yeah, I was super thrilled with that. And I think that's the last one. Yeah, so thank you all. Um, I hope you have a great night. And if there's any questions, I can answer them. Uh, the Roadrunner location, let's see, uh, was Taber Ranch and Event Center. Tabor. Tabor, sorry about that. Um, and it's in uh, the Cape Valley. Um, what else? Um, the rosy finches were in June or July, I think, but they should be there all summer. As long as it's not like snowed in, they should be there. And that was at Virginia Lakes Resort outside of um, Bridgeport. See. one new message okay okay yeah i think that's it so thank you amazing photos zane and many kudos from our uh participants tonight so thank you thank you okay allison um yeah so hi everybody um i decided to start leading some virtual field trips this year since we were all socked in with COVID and um, taking a, a leaf out of Melinda's book. Uh, this is a woman who lives in Monterey and she is very active in the John Muir Laws nature journaling community. Um, I decided to start leading a regularly scheduled independent nature journaling field trip where people would gather on Zoom, we would go over um, what, you know, what nature journaling is, what to do, um, and so on, and then all head out for an hour or an hour and a half, and then all come back and share our work. Um, so what a lot of people are very worried about with nature journaling is they say, I don't know how to draw. And the, the main thing is this is really about learning to see instead of learning how to draw. So, um, you know, taking a leaf out of uh, Joseph Grinnell's, um, you know, field, field journaling uh, class that he, would, that he would teach his students back in the, you know, the 1910s, 1920s uh, down at, at UC Berkeley. Um, you record the date, the time that you start, the time you stop, what's the temperature, what's the weather, and then you, you record how, what species you observe. And, um, you know, I know this is Audubon and I know we're mostly interested in birds, but I tend to also record mammals, herps, insects if I know them, and even plants if I know them. Um, and you know, just just helping people get comfortable with the idea that this doesn't, this is not about making art. It's about helping you observe better. And um, I have to say, this has been an, a surprisingly successful series. Um, I've had people join us from Southern California, from Oregon, Iowa, and it was zero degrees in Iowa that day. Uh, one person from Michigan, one person from Massachusetts, and two people from different places in Canada. So I'm not 100% sure how they're finding out about us, but it's kind of exciting that um, because of the pandemic, our, our reach, our little Yolo County birding reach has really expanded. Um, next slide, please. Um, so people do tend to get a little bit um, 
freaked out about what they what they need to take. And I think with 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 journals, it's exactly the same as with cameras. The one you have with you is the best one. So um, I do have uh, yeah, and um, Ken, I don't know why I'm. I cannot see myself, but um, I'm hoping people can see me. Um, I've got a, a nature journal here for me that is about um, eight by 12 or so. And that's a good size for me. It fits in my backpack along with my binoculars. Um, what I don't have on this list of materials, which really needs to be there, is a, is a little portable stool that goes in with my backpack. Um, but I use um, a pen. I tend to use a fountain pen with um, waterproof ink so I can do lay in a wash over it. But what I try and stress to people who join is that this is really personalized and make it your own. Use what works for you. So uh, go ahead, please, Ken. Um, I asked people to send me in things that they had learned uh, and what what really I, the question that I ask people when they come back in is, what did you notice that surprised you? And that is a good way of getting people to try and look for things that they maybe had not noticed before. Um, so this was in November. Uh, this person was very insecure about her drawing. But look what a look what a great journal page she made. She she got she got some information in there about the temperature. She got some information about the weather. She got some information about there was some wind. Um, what were the birds doing and and so on. So go ahead uh, next slide please. Um, this person did not see any birds. She saw goats with her with her son so they drew the goats and um they had seen them the day before and then uh that day it was actually raining i mean i know it's really hard to remember that it actually used to rain sometimes but um it it was it was a it was really good because what she was doing was applying what she had seen and she even made herself a little palette in the lower left there of the of the colors that she wanted to use so fall versus winter colors. So how, how winter becomes very monochrome. So go ahead, uh, next slide, please. And uh, this one, um, I really liked this because again, this person was very insecure about their drawing. So what they did is they, they put in some notes about this raptor that they saw and they had speckled brown on the belly, amber colored tail, Right now, I, you know, you can tell from this drawing, this person was looking at a red-tailed hawk and they didn't know their birds and they didn't know, you know, they're seeing a chickadee in, in Yolo County, unlikely. Um, but it was, it was wonderful because it was sort of, see, this is why you should do this. It's, you draw what you see, not sure what it is, you bring it back, you can look it up and you're able to identify what you saw. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is uh, a page of my of my nature journal. Um, I was doing the great backyard bird count and I had a huge flock, like 30 plus purple finches um, in, in my yard or just, just you know, visible from my yard. Um, and so I was really focusing on drawing them. And what I, um, what I think might be clear from this is if you work small, you can work fast and birds move. So, and often if you are looking at a large flock of birds like um, Mike's pelicans on Tule Lake, you've got a huge raft of pelicans there. So one's looking left, one's looking right, one's got its, its neck dipped. It doesn't always have to be the same bird. You can come back to each bird uh, that you see in that in that order. Um, so you know, draw the one with a with a with a bill straight out. Draw the one looking left, and keep coming back. It's like drawing baseball players because they're always doing the same thing. Next slide, please. And then this one was my uh, recording. This is the second day that I had seen 
Swainson Salt Hawks in, in downtown Davis this year. And it was really great to just be able to sit there and watch their displays and um, what are they doing? What is what is a Swainson's Hawk display? Because to be honest, it's a little bit sort of insignificant. You don't, it's not, it's not a very, it's not like ravens. Um, but what is it? What are they doing? And so I was noticing this, this tucking of the wings on the upswing and then opening them out again and then tucking them up as, as they went up again. Uh, at what point are they calling? At what point in that display? Um, so yeah, it, it's, um, it has actually been a joy to me to share this with people. And I would encourage everybody here, join in. You don't have to be an artist. You don't, it's, this is about learning to see. It's not about um, being, this is not art. This is honing our observation skills and you can keep this with you for the rest of your life. So get your camera, but definitely get your sketchbook. The one you have with you is the best one. So that's it. Thank you. And uh, I will entertain any questions. That was great, Allison. Thank you so much. Well, thank you. Allison, it's Ann. I'm too lazy to type. Uh, some of your comments uh, that you wrote there were, were so good about the species. Did some of those, did you write after you got back inside and you were kind of looking at the bird and you had thoughts about them comparing them to other birds or, or is it all done in the moment? I tend to do birds in the moment because I usually know them, but um, if there's a plant that I don't know, and if it looks like a plant that is not necessarily non-native, um, I will I will note a lot of stuff about it and then try and look it up. And I have a I have a good uh, botanist in the house, so that's that's great. Um, but yeah, no birds. I tend to write as I go. Um, and insects, <laughs> butterflies, butterfly. We have a lot of butterflies in our yard. It's interesting. This is a new a new house for us, a new garden. Uh, and so there are new butterflies to learn, which is which is which is great. Next, folks, we have Joanne Filotti. Now, I apologize to Joanne. I forgot to change the title here, but it's photographing spring migration in Texas. And I'll let Joanne tell you where in Texas. Okay, you're on, Joanne. So, okay, so uh, I was lucky enough to spend the last week in April uh, in, on Galveston Island um, photographing uh, birds during their spring migration. And uh, I, I participated in a workshop with Alan Murphy. And this particular workshop was, um, we were shooting primarily from photo blinds, which is not what I typically do in workshops. Usually we're out hunting for birds on foot or in cars, uh, but this one we did most of our shooting in blinds. Um, and so we had there, the setup was that there was a, a, a little pool that was set up with a, with a water drip. And basically the water drip, <clears throat> it was what brings them in <clears throat> there. And so, you know, as most of you know, that there are so many, uh, of these neotropical birds that um, breed in North America and in, um, in, in Canada, Northern US and Canada. And, you know, they're essentially in the spring, they make this long journey up from their wintering areas. And during the spring migration, you know, you can see all sorts of birds that you normally would have to drive all around the US and Canada to see. So it's kind of a um, a, a nice little glimpse at these species, um, although obviously not seeing them on their breeding grounds. Uh, and in Texas, you know, it's located perfectly because it's right in the central flyway migration uh, zone and corridor. And Galveston Island in High Island and a few other places are um, basically one of the first land masses that these birds come to once they come off the Gulf of Mexico. 
And so it's a great stopover uh, migration uh, habitat for them to stop and feed and refuel and, and rest so that they continue their journey up into their breeding regions. Um, and so this evening, what I was just gonna do is just show you a sampling of some of the photographs that I took there and just tell you, you know, a few interesting facts about them. So, so let's starting with the American red start. Uh, this bird, um, for those of you that have observed it before, you know that it's a very lively warbler and it hops from branch to branch. It's very fast moving. Um, and quite often you see it flashes its tail and its, and its wings. And it, it does this, it seems to, when it does this, it seems to um, kind of scare its prey so that they're easier to catch. Um, and they also do this uh, as a defensive um, stance as well. And they sometimes um, are referred to as the, the butterfly bird because of this quick fluttering motion that they do. And sometimes the males um, have two uh, mates at the same time during breeding season. But unlike other polygamous birds that keep their two females in the same territory, red starts quite often will have their two females in separate territories. And these territories can be a half mile apart. So um, moving to the next slide, the chestnut-sided warbler. So in contrast, the chestnut-sided warbler is a monogamous um, pair and they bond. Uh, and they're, they have really fun little courtship displays that involve spreading their tail feathers and wings and vibrating them in flight. And it's a, it's a really fun thing to see. Uh, males have, have two songs and one of them has uh, an accented at one end and the other one doesn't. And the first song they basically sing before arrival of the female and in the early stages of nesting. And then the second one they, they sing when they're raising the, the chicks and, um, and they're young and then they, and they also use it to defend their territory. So moving to Magnolia uh, Warbler, uh, they also have two songs uh, and they sing them for a, at, a, at about the same times, you know, during first one during nesting and then the sec, uh, during courtship and nesting and the second one to defend territory. Um, and it's always, always curious to know um, how some of these warblers are named, you know, so Magnolia Warbler. Well, it, it turns out that the Magnolia Warbler got its name because the first specimen of, the, of this warbler was collected in a magnolia tree and it was collected during spring migration um, and it, on its way up to Canada. So it, funnily enough, I mean, it's, there's not, it, it doesn't spend much time on a magnolia ever because it's not within its breeding uh, region and habitat. Um, they typically love, um, dense stands of conifers and they, they'll pick the um, insects and caterpillars out of the bottoms of the, of the needles. And their favorite food um, is, a, is caterpillars and particularly they like spruce bud worms. And they have these, while they have very specific habitat preferences uh, during breeding, when they're not breeding, they are, are much less choosy. So they, they typically will occupy a wide range of habitats ranging from sea level up to 5,000 feet. Sometimes you'll see them on um, cacao plantations or orchards and forests. So um, it's uh, kind of fun to see this sort of diversity in, in the habitats in the winter. Um, the Tennessee warbler, which is the next slide, and this is a, a, a female Tennessee warbler, which I think the colors are just really subtly beautiful. And, and the male actually is quite similar. It's got a lot more gray on the head and, and it doesn't have that white patch right on the rump. Um, and they're, they also um, prefer a similar breeding ground to the magnolia warbler where they like kind of uh, conifer forests and, and deciduous forests that are across, the, across Canada. But like the magnolia warbler, its favorite food is the spruce budworm. And on their breeding ground, the spruce budworm is their primary food. And up to 90% of their diet is, that's fed to their young is the, are these spruce budworms. And because they are so, uh, they, they have such a strong preference for these spruce budworms, they, um, the Tennessee warbler populations, they, they fluctuate, fluctuate up and down with the fluctuation in the budworm population. Um, so this is a, a kind of an interesting little 
uh, detail. And then they also um, are found in the winter. They typically um, are found on coffee plantations. So if you move to the next slide, which is my um, black and white warbler. And these guys, <laughs> they are typically seen creeping along tree trunks and branches and probing for um, grubs and insects in the bark. So they move quite quickly and they move very similarly to nuthatches, um, but unlike nuthatches, they, they typically, nuthatches will typically move um, downward as they feed and, and then and as well as brown creepers will typically move um, upward as they feed, but black and white warblers, they move in any direction. Um, they don't have a, a preference. And they, in, in order to do that, they have these extra long hind claws and heavier legs than most wood, war wood warblers. And that helps them hold on and onto, um, hold onto the bark and to move more easily on it. Um, and while they're very, very cute, they um, tend to be quite combative. Um, they will attack uh, a lot of a number of other species and fight them if they enter their territory. So they'll attack like black capped chickadees or red breasted nuthatches or American red starts. Um, so they, while they are adorable, they can be quite aggressive. If you go to the next slide, so this is a, a yellow breasted chat. Um, and so, you know, it's interesting, it was formally considered the largest warbler until recently where I guess it's been, there's been a lot of taxonomic studies and it's placed it into its own family. It was, it was placed into its own family, a family, I know I'm gonna botch this word, but it's Ictitera Day. And it's the same, almost the exact same name as New World Blackbirds, which is a family. So that's also pronounced Ictitera Day. And you might have to coach me on that one. But there's one letter difference between those two, two words. Um, then other, st other studies, I think more recent studies, have reclassified them into the blackbird family. So I'm not really sure where this stands right now, but um, I, you know, maybe someone afterwards can, knows more about this. But usually they're pretty difficult to see. They typically um, skulk around in dense thickets and they in scrubby areas. But during breeding season, they're known to um, basically perch very conspicuously on branches and sing. And sometimes they perform their, their flight display, which consists of this hovering, um, hovering and flapping their wings and dangling their feet. And it's, it's kind of a fun thing to see. So moving to the next slide, which is the indigo bunting. And you know, this is just a beautiful striking bluebird. Um, and it was actually one of my nemesis birds. I've been down to Texas couple of times before and never got a good shot of it. I saw it, but in, at a distance and it was, you know, these ones that were molting. But anyway, we fi finally got some nice shots of it. But the fun thing is, is that this striking bluebird is actually black. So this, this really stunning um, jewel-like blue color, it comes from these microscopic structures that they have in their feathers that reflect, refract and reflect blue light. Um, and so um, it's kind of a fun, fun little thing when you, when you think of them. And, you some, and it explains sometimes why you see them. Sometimes they're a little bit turquoisey. Sometimes they're a little bluer. You'll see some variations in color. And it just has to do with the light the reflections. And you know, like most um, passerines, they, they migrate at night and they use the stars for guidance. Um, there's been a lot of studies in indigo buntings. Um, and, they, and they've been shown to have this internal clock that enables them to continually adjust their orientation to a star, and even when that star is moving across the night sky. That's kind of a, a fun thing to know about them. Um, the other thing that I found really interesting about these guys is that they learned their songs um, as a youngster, but they don't learn their songs from their fathers. They learn it from other um, nearby males. And the um, buntings um, that are in their habitat, they, um, that have habitats that are a few hundred um, yards away, they have a completely different song. And, but if you listen to songs of buntings that are in the same habitat or the same song habitat, so to speak, they have the exact same song. And so, and some of these songs, they persist up to 20 years. 
So moving up to the painted bunting, uh, this, um, this is a pretty stunning bird. I, I mean, just the color combinations and the fusions of the, the yellows and blues and greens. And uh, it just makes it a really colorful, colorful guy. But unfortunately, their beauty um, makes them a target for illegal cage bird, the illegal cage bird industry. And so, you know, this puts a lot of pressure on their breeding population because they are, are caught on a regular basis, in particular in Mexico. You know, they eat seeds most of the year. Um, they switch mostly to insects during breeding season. Um, and they vigorously defend their territories, and their territories can be as big as three acres. So it's a, quite a large territory. So moving to the orchard oriole, um, this guy, he's the smallest oriole in North America, um, and he has a very short breeding season. Uh, they basically migrate north in the spring, in, in late spring, and then they head back to um, south to their wintering grounds as early as, as mid-July, um, having, you know, the most part, you know, to have one clutch, if that. Um, they typically will build nest uh, in groups, and so often you'll see multiple nests in a single tree, which is kind of a, a fun thing, and, and they mostly uh, eat on, feed on insects, um, but they will feed on nectar and pollen, and it's, uh, they actually pollinate some of the tropical plant species. And in the next slide, there's a rose-breasted grosbeak. Uh, and these guys are, are members of the cardinal family, and they prefer open, deciduous wood forests um, in Canada and eastern U.S. And the males um, establish territory. Um, they, they sing pretty loud to establish territory and to attract females um, during their breeding season. Um, but initially, when the females approach, they rebuke them. Um, they, they do this for two or three days and before they actually accept her as a mate. And once they're accepted, then they mate. Um, they're a monogamous uh, couple. And interestingly, the male gross beaks, they actually partake in nesting ritual. Um, they take a turn in incubating the, um, eggs on the nest for several hours a day. And, and then the females take over the rest of the day and, and all night. And, and when they actually switch um, from places, they both sing to each other these little sweet, uh, really low, silent, you know, very uh, low songs to each other as they switch places. It's kind of nice. Um, so the next um, two photos, they, these uh, show basic behavior. <laughs> And not necessarily good behavior, it's kind of uh, aggressive behavior. So when there's not a lot of birds in, coming to our blinds and it's a slow time, we don't typically put any food out in the blinds, it's just water. And, but when it's extremely slow, we will put out some oranges. And when we do this, we typically, you know, a fight initiates. And this particular fight is between a female cardinal and a female grosbeak. And what you really can't see is out, out of sight is there's an orange and this, this female grosbeak is not gonna let this female, uh, female um, cardinal have a bite of that orange and there's no way she's gonna let him get near it. But it is funny, there's other birds that come through that came to that same branch that she didn't bother with. But a female cardinal, no chance. And if you move to the next slide, it's a similar uh, situation, but it's a catbird in a, in a Baltimore Oriole. And again, just fiercely defending that orange. I mean, just they, and this happened again and again. And sometimes you'd see the catbird defending the orange, and sometimes, you know, you'd see two. Baltimore Orioles fighting for the orange. So it was, it made for some fun photographs when there was no other uh, migrating birds dropping onto the, into the um, water area. So it was a really fun trip. And I, we, it was my first trip since COVID and it was just kind of nice to get out even if it was shooting in blinds. And so I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of these birds in their breeding areas um, 
next year in Ohio. So thank you very much for listening and let me know if you have any questions. Hello. Joanne, there were some questions. Uh, Tanya asks, are the feathers of the lazuli bunting black as well? They have a similar looking hue of blue. Yeah, you know? I'm not 100% sure, but it wouldn't surprise me. And all the other comments are just how great your pictures are. Oh, thanks. Yeah, so, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, Joanne, that's pretty cool. Yeah, uh, and the birds, uh, I think it's uh, green and blue are structural colors as you described. So any, um, in referencing Tanya's question, uh, yeah, if it's blue, then it's structural and it's, it's the light as far as I know. Yeah. Okay. I was talking up a storm and I was muted. Um, anyway, uh, I wanna thank the, everyone. Um, well, this says it all and, and uh, thank you so much, our members and our friends. Um, we've, we've had a pretty good year, uh, a lot of participation um, from members and uh, I'm, I'm very grateful uh, for all of you. So I am going to stop sharing the screen so I can get a better look at the uh, questions. I see some chat. I see some more chats have come up. And um, let's see where we are. Can people see me when I presented or not? Yes. 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 We did. <laughs> no, see, I couldn't see myself. So I thought nobody could see me. That's why I didn't. I, I know, Joanne. I was showing my stool and my watercolors to the yellow Audubon logo. <laughs> no, but we saw them, that's the important thing. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, um, let's see, any other questions? Um, uh, lots of kudos, as Ann mentioned, but I, I think all of our, I mean, another round of applause for all of our presenters. Uh, I, I really appreciate them um, coming forward and uh, sharing with us. Um, and it was interesting to see what people did, how they how they did birding, and uh, during that time. And me, I stayed in my backyard, uh, and so uh, I'm glad these folks got out, and so that they'd be able to have these stories and photographs to share with us, all of us here. And I thank them very much for that. I uh, would say that there's nothing wrong with your backyard. There's <laughs> no a lot to draw in your backyard. There is. There is. As I go to okay, get look, you, at, look at Sammy. She's got a bloody Harris's sparrow. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Uh, I had a white throated yeah. sparrow also. Okay. Uh, I see a, a hand raised. Go ahead. Uh, I'm not even from Mural, but uh, I uh, I zoomed in into your meetings in COVID. I have a question, especially for Joanne. How do you, I mean, I don't know anything about you or what your background is, but how do you know all those details about the, all those behaviors of the birds? No, I, <laughs> I spent the last three days studying them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so she did her homework. <laughs> I know some of it, you know, because of you know when you're in the blinds, you're talking about the birds. I actually, when I was just I googled all these birds over the last you know couple of days, and just some of it I found out that I didn't some things I didn't know, and some things I knew. And so it's kind of fun. I do that a lot when I photograph birds. I tend to photograph, and then I learn a lot more about them once I'm home and I'm processing my photos and, right. and to do a little more research on them. Um, and these photographs are, are, are different, you know, than a lot of other photographs that I take because they were from a blind, right? So there's all sorts of perches set up and, you know, it's not, 
you're not really taking them in their native habitat. You're taking them, you know, as they're migrating up. I mean, it's still really fun and you can get, get to see a lot of birds, but, um, you know, it's just different. It's the first time I've done that. Hey, Joanne, tell them about your equipment. People are asking. I'm just gonna, starting to write that in the in a text because I forgot to say it. So I photograph with a 1DX2, a Canon 1DX2, and I have a 600 millimeter lens that I quite often for these little birds have a converter on. So I have about 840 millimeters of, um, to shoot with. So that's why I can get some of these little guys and I don't have to crop in too much. Although, you know, some of them of course are cropped. But yeah, it's uh, and I, of course I shoot on a tripod. I can't, I can't hold a 600 millimeter lens at all. So, so I got, I was just back to the other question. So I went on to the Cornell site. There's a, there's two or three sites that you can go on and they have put in any bird and they have all sorts of little, you know, information and, little facts and whatever about these birds. So it's kind of fun. I'm going to put that one of those sites in the uh, chat It's called All About Birds. Yep, I use that one. Yep. I definitely um, use the Cornell so site. So if you, yeah, it's mm -hmm. uh, if you just Google All About Birds, it'll get you to the Cornell site. Yep. They even have a feature uh, if you don't know what you're looking for, but you know what it looks like, you can select color, size, bill size, that sort of thing. And it'll get you a variety of uh, any kind of uh, suspect that uh, looks like what you might've seen. It'll, it'll lay it out there for you. And uh, you can say, that's the one officer. And um, so that's a good site for folks. Yeah, and, or, or if you're out in the field, you can use Merlin. Merlin's yeah. Great. Identifying birds. Normally, I don't. I don't recommend all about birds to my neighbors. Otherwise, they won't have any reason to call me. So, <laughs> anyway, um, and so that's that's fantastic. So, does anybody else know about the red, ye yellow-breasted chat and what the status is for the taxonomy? Because I had different I, different sites kind of had different opinions, and I wasn't sure. It's unsafe. I read something some time ago, and I think uh, after what you said tonight, I'm going to do some more serious looking. And Anne, how do you pronounce it? Uh, I don't know, Joanne. You notice I didn't interrupt you to speak up. <laughs> I pronounce the blackbirds as icterit. Whether that's right or not, that's how yeah. I learned it. And that's what yeah. I've use, been using for 40 odd years now. It's a family Icteridae. Teridae, right. And, and both of them are pronounced a teridae. There's just an I in the new family for the- Yeah. yeah. Are you sure that's not a spelling mistake? No, no, it's it's a family versus versus species. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, There's a you know, yeah. 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 And uh, I had an opportunity to be in, in uh, Ogden, Utah and there's a, uh, a a park and a and a, and a path called uh, Birdsong Trail, and the chats were going crazy. They were posting up. I mean, I heard them. I got glimpses over the years, but you know, you can sit there and watch watch a chat up in the tree doing its singing. And I think I might have seen what you described as that sky hopping uh, type of float flying up and coming down. It's pretty cool, but. You talk about water is a good attractor, even if you don't have a feeder. Um, with a drip, water and drip, you know, you can come by and birds might come by. Um, and uh, that's uh, kind of exciting to see who comes uh, to your water feature. And yeah. that's, that's kind of cool. They are thirsty. Excellent. They really Excellent. want to bath more than they want to drink the water. It's really yeah. cool. And uh, earlier this week, I was talking with, chatting with uh, Mike Reinhardt, and yeah, I I haven't been to Tule Lake for a few years now, but gosh, uh, for you know, 30, 40 years, of, uh, you know, going like every November since I was up that way anyway, and uh, just a day trip up to Tule Lake there, and we were there one time, and it was a foul cholera, and so this is like the day after Thanksgiving, there were. A couple of small pools of open water 
and all around that were birds that were really too sick to go anywhere. You know, that's where you get point blank looks at Ross's goose, cackling goose. And this is in my early years of birding. Um, uh, I was going to say marsh hawks, but now they're northern harriers feeding on duck. We counted about 300 bald eagles that day and about 150 golden eagles um, helping to uh, clean, clear things up. Um, the fall color was really, really. Uh, it's kind of brutal to see that, but uh, Tule Lake is a special place for me. Thank you, Mike, for doing that. And then Sammy and Jane, uh, wonderful, wonderful outings. Uh, really enjoyed listening to all of you. And Allison, I can't draw, and I get sidetracked when I'm trying to do something else. You can totally draw. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> Stop it. Stop it. I, just, I, I have some, Allison, where I've got these third grade images, then all of a sudden there's one that looks like yours there, and I'm saying, okay, why did I put that on the page with the third grade pictures, you know, so I have to crop it out, but uh, yeah, I have too many interests. <laughs> this is like everything else, the more you do it, the better you get. Yeah. But it's yeah. not about making art, just remember, it's about learning to see. Yeah, I have to keep trying to tell myself that because it, if I tackle something, it's got to be perfect, you know, so. No, no. But yeah, I, I do enjoy doing that, just going out in my backyard and, and uh, uh, just looking through my toy on, you know, and there's a leaf-footed bug. You go over to the cherry tomato plants and then there's the end stars of leaf-footed bugs. And um, sitting there on my, my bench, I set up a bench and it's about, I have, I collected interesting branches from the street before the crawler came, the claw came, and I kind of propped those up because I noticed birds were posting in the toy on before going to the water. So I put this branch out and, and most times they will post on that branch before going to the water. And I'm sitting there and, and, and I, I've always put stakes I started with dowels, now I'm going with limbs propped in the Oregon grate for dragonflies to rest at. And I'm sitting there and this the female widow skimmer sits there. She'd flurry out and come back, you know, like a king, like a, a fly catcher. Well, one time she came back and she had a seven spotted um, ladybug and, and sat there and chowed down on it. And I'm, you know, she's like six feet away and it's just, whoa, very cool. Yeah, so sitting there watching that. With a, with a drought, it's really a great idea to get some kind of water feature in your yards to let birds rest <laughs> and take water. So if you're up for that, if you have the engineering skills, I'm not sure I do, but I really encourage people, you can transform your birding experience in your yard if you have water running. It doesn't have to be running fast, but you know. Yeah. I one time ran a refrigerator um, ice maker kit with the copper tubing uh, from my kennel and I had a ceramic post mounted dish. And so I ran, I put a Y on the kennel hose bib, ran the, the copper tubing there, made a little drip, and then drilled and put some other copper in the bottom so I'd add a drain. Uh, and boy, the birds just love that drip. They just come to it. So anyway, um, anyone else have anything they want, they want to share? This is the last meeting of the year. Oh, uh, Ken. Oh, we're out of time, Sammy. No, just kidding. <laughs> as always, I'd like to invite everybody to uh, look at uh, our Facebook page, and if they have photos that they'd like to share, uh, they can be posted on there and uh, uh, everybody can see them. So uh, Facebook, we also have uh, our website too, which uh, Deb is probably taking pictures for the website. So we should Good get point, lots Sammy. of pictures. Thanks for mentioning that. President Ann, any, any closing remarks? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'll look forward to seeing everyone next September. And thanks for sticking with us this year. Yes, we really appreciate that. Thank you, Ken, for all your work. It was wonderful the way you put this together. Yep. Thanks well, to thank Ken you. and to Ann and to all the other presenters. It was really, really good. Yeah, yes, thanks, good group. Very nice PowerPoint presentation. And I really enjoyed everybody else's.
presentation too. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I thank you. I, I tried to make it look pleasing and uh, I guess it worked out. Excellent. Okay. With that, and you're the president. You get to close it. Adios. <laughs> See you in September. <laughs> Good night, folks. Have a great rest of the evening. And we'll Bye -bye. see you in September, if not on the birding trail.